help me. And so, Lord, today we thank you for those of us who are still in the journey of marriage. We are growing moment by moment, day by day. And we have submitted ourselves to you through the tests and trials of life. And you are molding us, reminding us that in this journey that we are understanding more clearly your love for your church and your church's dedication to you. So now guide us at this afternoon as we speak on this beautiful and important topic, and may you be praised and glorified, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you bring up that slide on the screen, the uh, seminar is entitled, To Have and to Hold On. To have and to hold on. You know, so many people marry for better or for worse, but not for good. For better or for worse, but not for good. My wife and I have been married for 35 years. Here's a picture of us. And um, yesterday I showed the audience a picture of us when we first got married. I'll throw one in there right now because if you were not here yesterday, you surely want to see this clueless young couple. We were clueless and we have grown. We have grown in so many ways. I even added gray hair to it. But um, the Lord has blessed us in such a way that was us there. But this is a picture of us 35 years ago on the picture on the left. That's us to have and to hold from this day forward for sickness and health and richer for poor, storms or rains, no money in the bank, no food in the cabinet. And here we are 35 years later, a lot of chisels, a lot of marks, a lot of burns, but we are growing in the Lord. Can you say amen? amen. Too many people marry for better or for worse, but not for good. I remember the story about the Englishman who met an American at a wishing well in England. And this was an amazing story. The English man said to the American man, he said, you know, with all the divorces in America, America is becoming the land, uh, America is becoming quickly the land of the free. With all the divorces, America is becoming the land of the free. And that American man thought, what can I say to this English chap? So we said, well, we're still getting married, so we are the home of the brave. <laughs> Amen? The home of the brave. Still getting married, we're the home of the brave. And one of the greatest examples of a marriage is, in fact, that because the Lord put the husband and wife together in a perfect setting in the Garden of Eden, as he blessed the Sabbath, he blessed the marriage. And we know the Sabbath has been under attack for a long time. And one of the last pieces, I believe, in Satan's puzzle, in Satan's arsenal against the, the church, is the destruction of the marriage. So we, we should not say we are married for better or for worse, but we must say we are married for good. Now, I know that in some cases, people have been married once, some have been married twice, some have been married three times, some have been married four times, some have been married five times, and the list goes on and on and on. Some people believe in marriage like Elizabeth Taylor. She's been married many times. And you know, she's resting now. She's passed away. But what we must believe in, not just the institution of marriage, but we must believe in God's ability to carry us through the storms of life, through the challenges of life, through the disappointments of life, and through the scars, and even when we get patches. As you know, some of you grow up and you have a cut here or a broken leg there, but I learned a very valuable lesson when I broke my tibia. I had so many broken bones, I didn't get paid for any of them. They were all broken because I liked sports. But I learned something very valuable from one of my doctors when I broke my tibia bone. I think that's the one, the thin one down in the shin. Um, he said to me something that was very profound, which I've learned about relationships. He said, when that bone heals, when that bone resets, it is going to be stronger than all the other bones in your leg. And I said, well, how is that possible? It got broken. He said, oh, anytime a bone breaks, it, re it builds, re it retrofits itself with a calcified, a, a calcified sleeve that surrounds it. 
I said, explain that to me. He said, well, what happens is because the bone experienced a break, it builds around it somewhat of a wall, a fortress, that makes it stronger than it was before. And my wife and I have learned in the places in our lives where we've had attacks from outside of our marriage, challenges within our marriage, either, either battles that came to us or sometimes battles of our own making, we've learned that through all of those, at the broken places in relationships, God is able to retrofit us and cause those bad experiences, those broken places, to become places that are not just healed, but we're stronger at those broken places than we were before. Can I get an amen? amen? But only as you submit to the process, only as you are determined to stay in the journey, will you even be able to appreciate aspects of that journey. Now, for the benefit of those, and I'm looking at the audience, for the benefit of those who are here, I want to put that list up again, and I'll just get in just a moment here, of all the aspects of what marriage is included and the different facets of a relationship and how we should look at them. Because when you think about, when you think about building a house, I talked about this to somebody the other day, when you think about building a house, you think about the house in its completed form, but um, we were studying the sanctuary and we're learning this at our church. And I said, when you think of the sanctuary message, think of the sanctuary in your, in your elementary understanding as a blueprint. You know, Pastor Ivor Meyer has a wonderful book called The Blueprint, and he talks about the sanctuary message. But before you could see the full picture developed, you think about the architecture or the architect that puts together the blueprint. And he takes you to the spot where the house is about to be built. And he says, in this corner right here is going to be the master bedroom. And he walks the dimensions of the master bedroom. And he said, and right over here is going to be the, the jacuzzi tub. And here is going to be the two-person shower. And then right across from that is going to be the suite where we kind of have a little couch chair. And he's excited because he sees it. And you're thinking, this guy is a nut. He's excited about dirt. There's just, we're running back and forth on dirt. And he's excited about it. And then when you go home and you say to your family member, where were you going for the last two hours? Well, you know, Harry was showing us where he's building his house. He's going nuts over something. There's nothing there because Harry sees it before it's finished. You see, what I love about God, he sees the blueprint of the marriage. Before, yes, honey. He sees it. He says, it has not yet been revealed what you shall be. 1 John 3, verse 2, it has not yet been revealed what you shall be. He sees us not only in the finished product of our righteous walk with him, but he sees the husband and wife, and he says to this young couple, there we are again, he says to this young couple, it has not yet been revealed what you shall be. But he says to the husband, you've got stuff in you that i got to get rid of for you to be what I see. He says to the wife, there's stuff in you I got to get rid of for you to be what you need to be. And so he takes us through this process kind of like a white shirt being put in a, 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 a hot washing machine with hot water. If a white shirt could talk, what would it say? Think about it. What did I do to be put in this hot water, and to make it worse, you throw Clorox in here, and I can't see. And then you got detergent, and I'm in there drowning and being agitated, and I'm saying, what is this all about? And the Lord is saying, there are stains in you. I need to get out. And, this, and just when the water begins to drain away, all of a sudden, the shirt said, finally, the ride is over. Then he hears a click. And all of a sudden, comes a spin cycle. <laughs> and he's holding on for dear life. I can only do that three times. He's holding on for dear life until the Lord is wringing out every, every bit of him that's still left. And he falls to the floor of his experiences like, ah. And he sees a light above as the washing machine is opened. And he's taken out, he says, finally, it's over. 
and he's carried across the room into another hard machine. And they said, you thought it was over. And they open the draw, and they drop him in. <laughs> and he hears another click, and he says, it's getting hot in here. What's that all about? And then he realizes, this is not what they told me would happen when that guy came to the store and bought me. This is not what I signed up for. But he's wringing every vestige of himself. The Lord is wringing out everything that is still there. Then he's finally taken out and he says, oh, I'm so glad it's over, only to be plunged on an ironing board. And then you realize what marriage is all about. Then you realize what Christ's relationship with his church is all about. And since you thought that was just a wonderful imaginary picture, the Bible says he's coming back for a church. Are you ready? Without what? Spot or wrinkle or any such thing. Well, you know what? That's what a marriage is. It has spots and wrinkles in it. When you say I do, you don't have a clue. Can I get a witness? <laughs> Husbands learn the manipulative way of answering questions. Does this look, does this make me look fat? I don't know. Did you like your dinner? It was wonderful. <laughs> it was great. You know, we learn and we grow together. And the wife realizes there are things about this man that she married that she doesn't like. And she begins to see it. And there are things in this woman that he married, and she was the most beautiful woman on their wedding, but all of a sudden he sees the dark side of her coming out, and he says, and I don't like and the Lord says, now you understand how I see my church. There are lots of things in my church I don't like, but I'm not going to let her go. And my wife and I have determined not to be married for better or for worse, but for good. But if you're on your second marriage or third, this is also for you. Because at no point does the Lord say that we are beyond the point of redemption. But let me show you this list very carefully, because this is who we are when it comes to marriage. I'm just going to put them all on the screen very carefully very quickly, and I'll just touch on them, because what we're going to do in this seminar, we're going to go through all the areas of the relationship that as a counselor, these are the things we talk about when it comes to what the complete relationship is all about. And my wife and I are going to do some role playing today. We're going to have fun together. And you know what's nice about role playing? And some of you who are married, you know that. Role playing in public is really your, public, your private experience being acted out in public. And uh, have any of you ever had an argument before? You want to raise your hand? Do you want to admit that? Now, she raised her hand, but her husband's not with her. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But we've all had arguments. Have you had disagreements? Have you had those kind of disagreements where you go to bed and you said, I am not, not tonight, I am not. I, I've, I've, I've given him all, the, I've given him before, but tonight I'm holding the rein. I am right, and this is not the time that I'm going to say sorry for something I did not do. My wife and I had that before. We used to, you know, when you first get married, you're really cordial. Honey, sweetheart, would you like something to drink? Sure. What would you like? I'll go to the store and buy it for you. I, ha I have something I want to share with you tomorrow. Remind me, honey, I want to show you the transitions of marriage, what happens when you go through relationships and how they transition. But, as all, but only as you submit to the process will you realize that you can grow. Look at this. This is the components. These are the components of a marriage. Marital expectation. We talked about that yesterday. What you expect internally and what you actually experience externally. And then today what I want to talk about is personality issues. And then communication. By the way, communication is the umbrella under which everything in your relationship is affected. And I'll point out that in a moment just here. Then conflict resolution. Tomorrow we're going to go through the 10 steps of conflict resolution. Now, the wonderful thing about all of these aspects is they work. But as you know, the only place that success comes before work is where? In the dictionary. The only place success comes before work is in the, in the dictionary. Don't expect success without work. And you know what? 
Diets would work if people would practice them. Education works if people will study. Everything that we are submitted to in a process, either theoretically or experientially, it'll work if we want to do the work. It works, it's successful, but we have to submit to the process. Look at this. Not only conflict resolution, but financial management. A lot of people think that most of the time people break up because of financial issues. No, that's further down on the list. We'll find out the number one reason why people break up, but it's not financial reasons. However, if you marry for the purpose of thinking that you together can afford a good life, it's cheaper to borrow the money from the bank than to marry somebody for money. Because you may think that the both of you together in your combined income could have a good life, but when you realize the interest rate is a whole lot higher than it is with a bank. You can walk, walk away from a bank and pay them the note. But when things go awry in your relationship because of marriage, I remember somebody said to me not too long ago, they said to the husband, which was, a, which was a third marriage for both of them, she said to him at the very beginning, and she was very intentional, she said, I will not marry a cheap man. If you're going to marry me, you can't love your money more than me. And she won. She got a car about a week later. But some people marry for financial reasons. Some people say we can afford a very good life together. That's not the reason to be married. You shouldn't marry because you could live with the person. You should marry because you can't live without them. Now, that in and of itself, in some degree, is unrealistic because some couples have said, and listen to this, some people have said, you're the only one I can ever love. And you know what happens? If one person is deceased, they find somebody else, even though they may not love that person as deeply. But God has allowed love to still exist in relationships. But then there's leisure activities. Then there's the sexual relations. Let me tell you something. Guys, can I talk to the guys for a moment? Ladies, don't close your ears, but don't pay a lot of attention to this. Guys, don't fall in love with things that are going to change. I'm trying to be very kind. Like the guy said to his, the lady said to her husband, Honey, are you going to love me when I turn gray? He said, I've loved you through every other color. <laughs> now, you know some of you guys, we had a couple in our church, they're both deceased now, but they were well in their 90s. Uh, and one is Bob and the other one is B. And we would go visit them and B would always laugh. I said, B, why are you always laughing? She says, when I look at Bob and me on how we were and how we are, I just have to laugh. Because she'd talk to Bob and he'd say, she'd say, hey, Bob. He'd say, huh? What? He can't hear as well as he used to. And he could hardly move as well as he can. And she could hardly move. And she showed us the pictures. And this is why I have a, I have a deep love because of my great love for the man who raised me. He was 50 years old when he decided to take me on as an abandoned three-month-old baby where my mother and father left me and my sister at their home. I was abandoned at three months old and left at an Adventist babysitter. And the husband and the wife were 50 years old when they decided to take on the task of raising my sister and me. So I have such a deep love, and I say this respectfully, for older people. You know why? Because we are all getting old, but we were not always, always old. Amen? We were not always old. But I've decided to let my gray hair show so I could tell the guys that are just coming out of the seminary, I've been around a while. I got some more intellectual smarts than you do, and I have some experiences and bruises to prove it. But we were not always old, but what I appreciate about that 
is when we get to the places of life where the things that we used to be attracted to are no longer the pinnacle of our attraction, you should be able to look back and have memories that still cause you to smile even though you really can't hear. That's why my wife and I go everywhere together. Elder Brooks told me and my wife, he said, John, Angela, he says, when you get, when you get to the place where you can no longer travel, and you, all you have is memories. Make sure that both of you are in those memories. So as a pastor, I think that, and I'm not saying this boastfully, but I don't know as many pastors as they travel the world that people say, how is Angela? When people write us, they say, say hello to your wife for me. When I go around the world, I take my wife with me. If people, don't want to be, if people don't want to pay for her to go, I say, cancel me. Somebody wanted me to go to Africa without her, I said, I'm not coming. They said, you're on the advertisement. I said, that's fine. I'm going to speak for 9,000 people. You can't afford one more ticket for my wife, then I'm not coming either. I'm not going without her. And so we travel together because I want my memories and our memories to be together. But we have learned through the changes of life, through the gray hair, through the higher testosterone levels, come on, men, and say amen. amen. <laughs> through the higher testosterone levels, we have, <laughs> I'm being real with you, okay? Right? Before you had to get that extra pill, you know, we were, we used to be vibrant. We would run and jump off of things and not get hurt, but hey, at a certain point in life, you lower yourself. There was a time when I, was, I could jump off of this podium, do a roll, and stand up and say, hello. I don't do that anymore. But I'm thankful that I'm not living on medication because God has given us a wonderful life, and both of us together can enjoy that. We went to Australia, and they said to us as we entered into Australia, they said, do you have any medication to declare? I said, no. They said, sir, do you have any medication at all to declare? We said, no. They said, all Americans have medication to declare. <laughs> I said, we don't, and we praise the Lord for that. We never thought about that. But, but sexual relations and physical attributes are things that are going to change as time goes on. Don't let that be the sole connection, but don't ignore it. If you're married, I'm going to say it just like this, and I hope all, the, all of you are here. I'm mature enough to handle this. As long as you can, do. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> Hallelujah. Children and parenting. We're going to talk about that. Because too many parents are the children, and too many children are the parents. We're going to talk about that. Family and friends. When my wife and I got married, our friends did not come before us. She never said, I'm going out with the girls. I never said I'm going out with the guys. Who are my friends before I met you? No, we are friends, not just husband and wife. Don't put family before your wife. Don't put friends before your spouse or your husband. When difficulty comes, don't run to mama. Don't run to papa. Run to Jesus. And if you need a third person, get a counselor. Role relations. Some people don't know what it's like to be a husband. Some people don't know the values of what it means to be a husband. We're going to talk about that. Some women don't know what a kitchen is for. It's never too late to buy a cookbook. Mark Anthony has a beautiful one. And then when it comes to the strongest bond in a relationship, and I believe this, you can be happily married in so many areas, but when your spiritual beliefs are on a different page, it's a lonely day in church. Some people have been married for many, many years. Thank God that they've lasted that long. But to be unequally yoked is to miss one of the greatest expressions of marriage, and that's to worship and serve God together. Somebody once said, there are no men in the church. And I said to one young lady, have you traveled to Brazil yet, or to the Philippines, or to Europe, or to the Caribbean to find a husband yet? No. Well, when you do that, when you're done doing that, then tell me there are no men in the church. Amen? But he's a nice guy. He loves me. 
my wife has a saying, honey, come here. I want you to tell them why you held out. Come here, sweetheart. I'm going to give her the microphone. Amen. Just say it from down there. When you met me, why you were determined. Okay. You can say it right there, honey. <laughs> why does he put me on the spot? Because <laughs> you're good on the spot. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. <laughs> I get nervous. I know when I married, well, when we dated. Yeah, come next I'm to me. I'm stay right there. Thank you, honey. I feel better. When we dated, I, he wasn't in the church, and I wanted somebody in the church. I knew if I could get someone that loves the Lord, he will love me. And so I always invited him for our family worship. I used to go to his house on Sabbath morning. And he'd be at a party Friday night, and I'd go to his house and wake him up. His father would let me in, and I would say, come on, you're going to church with me. He said, I just got home at 4.30 this morning. I said, I don't care. You're going to church with me. And so I don't know how I had the holy boldness, <laughs> but I, I said, you're going to church with me. And so I said, tell him, go shower. I'd press his clothes for him because he lived about three blocks from the church in Brooklyn. And I would press his clothes, and, and um, you'd go shower, and I'd come back. Yeah, she'd, and I'd she'd say, I'll be downstairs waiting for you. Yeah, and so he'd change, and he'd go to church with me every Sabbath, and, but he'd be sleeping in church. Oh, every Sabbath he'd sleep, and I'd pray for him. I said, I want him in the church. And if he was not going to love the Lord, I, I would actually cut it off. I, as much as I loved him, I would have cut him off if he did not love the Lord. So I was determined that... <laughs> Well, the Lord was, it's not me. <laughs> but um, after a while, you kept coming yeah. to church. Until we got converted, we went to an evangelistic series together. Yeah. And at 19, we got baptized together. Yeah. And that was the beginning of a journey where I was slowly but surely cutting away the past of my life. Yeah. And then, then I realized, yeah, you know what? That's going to be the strongest connection we have. And because of that connection, because of our spiritual connection, that has been one of the reasons why we were able to survive every other challenge. Oh. Because you know what? When you go through trials and you can't pray together and you yeah. can't open your Bible together yeah. and you can't ask God while you're studying your Sabbath school lesson or while you're at church together, when the other trials of life come and you don't have a spiritual connection together, it's the hardest thing. It is. It's the loneliest place. Mm -hmm. So my wife, uh, people said she was pushy. No, I said she was on a mission. I was her first convert, and uh, look at what the Lord has done in our lives since. Thank you, sweetheart. And I wanted a priest in my home. I wanted him to, That's before right. he was a pastor, ladies, you want your husband to lead out, don't you? You want your husband to be the priest of the home. There's nothing like your husband say, come on, let's have prayer, instead of the wife always saying it. Let the husband do it. Take your role as a man, as the priest Preach, of your honey. home. I'm not preaching. Of the priest of your home. And say to your wife, it gives me such joy, even before he was a pastor, he said, come on, let's read the Bible. What? It, ladies love that, don't we, ladies? Right? Amen. We love it when our husbands are the priests of the home. So, honey, continue to be my priest. Ooh. I'll kiss you afterwards. <laughs> but uh, that's true. And you know the other thing? In, in the Lord as, as we grow, uh, sometimes even in our entertainment, sometimes, you know, you're thumbing through the channels on television and you stop at something that, for whatever reason, it becomes in, inappropriate. And I say, honey, we're not watching that. That's not what God wants us to watch. She said, and this is true. She said, you know, I was wondering if this is okay with you. But I'm so glad you said it's not. Thank you for telling me that it's not. And sometimes, yeah, like there's some ch channels on television, you know, they always, thank you, honey. See, because it's true doesn't mean you should watch it. Right? A lot of stuff on television is true. And, you know, ladies like those, what do they call those chick flicks? Everybody's mushy and they're always in love and everybody's hugging all over each other. But then all of a sudden they turn dark and another man wants to get this man's wife and 
she moves in, and before you know it, the family's split. I don't like to watch that stuff. Come on, somebody. Can you say amen? I don't like to give any glory to shows that tear down the marriage. I don't like to watch that stuff. And that's what I want to talk about today because we're going to talk about personality issues. And then, there's, then there is, on top of spiritual beliefs, then there's family of origin. And many of you should know that who you have become and who you may still be has a lot to do with your family. That's your tapestry. We call that the circumflex model. Are you, are, did you come from a family that's connected or overly connected? Did you come from a family that's disconnected or overly disconnected? Did you come from a family where, every, where one person made all the decisions or nobody made any decisions? Did you come from a family where the father was in charge and the mo mother never talked? Or where the mother was in charge and the father was never involved? All these things determine how you see your marriage. That's family of, of origin, and that also affects the role of the relationship. But now let me ask the question, what is personality issues? Say that with me. What is personality? It's very what it says, personality. Here is a definition. Personality issue is, issues are the historical experiences, hurts, dreams, failures, successes, desires, and expectations, these are things all wrapped up inside of you. Personality issues. In other words, who's Angela? Who's John? That's why it's often good to become familiar with the family of the person you're about to marry. Because you don't just marry a person. <laughs> you marry the whole family. And my, fam my wife has, she's the youngest of eight. I ran into five Jamaican brothers when I married her. Not five brothers, five Jamaican brothers. Those are brothers on steroids. West Indians from the Caribbean or the Caribbean, whichever one you say, strong family values. Don't stand for no kind of foolishness. They'll come after you if you hurt their sister. They'll come after you in a choir form. Not one, but two, four, eight. People that have strong values. They don't, they, don't, they don't stand back when things go bad. Personality issues. But what you should know about personality issues, and look at this very carefully, personality issues are broken into two categories, who you inherently are and who you project. Because a lot of times we only project the person the other... We only project the side of us that we want the other person to see. And we often hide the person we really are. And I'll give you an example. I was sitting before a couple. I was getting them ready for marriage, a young couple. And the, and the bride-to-be was asked by the husband, said to her, what would you like to eat? She said, what would you like to eat? He said, where would you like to go? She said, where would you like to go? And I stopped her and I said, young lady, let me say something to you. You're young, you're about to get married, but you're about to lose your mind and your identity. He asked you, what would you like to eat? Just tell him what you'd like to eat. He asked you, where would you like to go? Just tell him where you'd like to go. Because I said, in five years, you're going to wake up and wonder where you, where you disappeared to. You're going to wonder who you are. And you're going to wake up and one day say, I don't know myself, and I don't like who I've become, and you're going to leave him because you're going to accuse him of absorbing you when you gave him permission to absorb you. So we're going to talk about how to say, how to tell your spouse what you want, and ladies, here's the secret, and actually get it. Now, don't use it manipulatively, but how to ask for what you want and know how you're going to get it. So one of the so who you are inherently, that means who you are on the inside and who you project. Some people, and this is something I also learned as a pastor, some people project a very soft personality in public, but behind closed doors, Lord have mercy. Remember one, one pastoral visit, it wasn't me, but another group of pastors went to visit a couple, a married couple, and this was in New York, you know, and when they walked up to the door and knocked on to visit this couple. The wife said, 
come on in, pastor. And he said he saw the husband in the corner shaking for his life. And in New York, he discovered, he said they actually had, at that time, a battered husband's shelter. And he said he learned that some of these women are tough. You know, they, they'll throw their husband across the table. You know, tell them who, who he is and uh, relax. <laughs> tell them where to go and give them a token to get there. So everybody is not who they project. But who we inherently are will eventually come out. But if you don't bring that person out in a way that will enhance your relationship, that person is going to come out in a way that's going to be a detriment, and you're going to wonder, whatever happened to me? And then the other thing that's a, a signal to me is when couples say to me, we have never argued. And I ask the question, so which one of you is brain dead? Because nobody agrees all the time. Can I get an amen? amen? But some people are afraid to disagree. Healthy, my wife and I, we disagree. Amen, honey, say amen. Say amen. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Say amen because I told you. No, I'm just kidding. I'm sorry, honey. No, no but uh, we disagree. We still disagree. Because you know what? She shouldn't have to be forced to like what I like. Come on, ladies. And I shouldn't have to be forced to like what he likes. If I like something different, some people say, you want a red flower? No, I like a carnation. That's okay. Tell them you want a different kind of flower. And he buy, sometimes I'd go to, and this is a habit, sometimes I go to buy something and I buy my wife the same exact thing because I, you know, I want to get away with it. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes a husband buys something that he wants, but just to kind of lessen the financial impact, he says, honey, I also bought you something. And my wife says to me, I didn't tell you to buy me anything. You didn't have to buy me anything. Because you wanted it, you didn't have to buy me anything. And then sometimes, and this happens, but period, you know, sometimes she'd say, I really liked it, but I wish you gave me a choice of the color. She's very much her own person. Amen, ladies? Feel free to be your own person. Repeat after me, ladies. Feel free, Feel free to be your own person. Because your husband didn't want to, here's the reason, the husband did not want to marry somebody exactly like him because if two people ag agree on everything, one of you is unnecessary. <laughs> Am I right? You didn't marry somebody to be exactly like you, so stop, mar you got attracted because she wasn't like you, then you marry her to make her just like you. You married him because he wasn't just like you, but then after you got married to him, you want to make him just like you. Leave him as he is and let God make the changes. Which means, if you marry somebody that's not in the church, don't become an evangelist and try to convert him. Who he is when you marry him or her is who they're going to be for a long time. Amen. Thankfully, we, married, we, we dated for nine years. We had our selfish days. And every now and then, we are reminded that there's still some residue. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Look at personality issues. Some of the ways to approach personality issues. Until you come to terms with who you are, you have hazardly project your negative and positive characteristics. Meaning, be in control Come to grips with who you are. My wife was shy when I met her. She was very shy. She was the youngest of eight. And when you're the youngest of eight children, you have an older brother, another brother, uh, an older brother, an older sister, another brother, another brother, another brother, another brother, then a sister, and then you. And they all told her what to do. That's tough. And so she grew up pretty much taking instructions from everybody above her. And I learned in my marriage that one day I was wondering why, she's, why she is the way she is. And one day she said it to me. She said, you remind me of my brothers. I said, what was that like? She said, they're always telling me what to do. 
And you know what I learned? I'm not going to tell her what to do. I'm going to ask her what she wants to do. And we've grown in that area. Amen, honey? And even just over the last year, she had to remind me, you're not listening. You're not listening. We're going to talk about how to make sure you're listening. You know, even after 35 years, you can still learn. But if you don't come to terms with who you are, you will haphazardly, that means outside of your control, project not only the positive things, but the negative things. Come to terms with who you are. Resolving personality issues, and this is something, this is very important. Work on your relationship dynamics. Let me just put it to the next screen. Work on your relationship dynamics. Relationship dynamics. What is relationship dynamics? Do any of you have a heartbeat? If you don't have a heartbeat, raise your hand. <laughs> it's the up and downs of life. That's relationship dynamics. It's the pulse and the pullback. The pulse and the pullback. You see, some couples don't know how to express thoughts and feelings. And what they do as a result of that, they create, they, they create, and, and what I refer to, you can create your, a welcoming position, but you have to know how to express your thoughts and feelings so that you can create a welcoming disposition. So some people, uh, they talk in a way, uh, and, and this is something I learned just over the last week and a half. The Lord brought this to me in the car while we were driving. Do you know, do you know why there are so many bars and saloons? Do you know that more men are in bars and saloons than women? And you know why? Because if, if their wives created an environment that they wanted to come home to, they would come home rather than go to the bar. Now that's a brave man. And I learned in a very real way, oftentimes the reason why men would rather go to a bar than go home is because they don't, they rather get drunk than go home. Because somewhere along the way, a comfortable, welcoming atmosphere has not been created, and they'd rather get drunk and throw up with a stranger than go home and communicate with the person they got married to. And this all happens because we don't, we don't know our relationship dynamics. Huh? Yeah. Oh, my wife, I told you my wife helps me preach a sermon. That's why, that's why Solomon the wise man said, and ladies, my wife reminded me of this. It's better to dwell in the corner of a rooftop than in a house with a contentious woman. Please don't say amen. Because women could be tough. And whenever I meet a guy that reminds me of some of those qualities, some guys could have those qualities. They could be like a continual, Solomon also says, uh, 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 and, and I'm going to balance this out, but I'm just where I'm here right now. Sometimes a nagging woman could be like continual dripping of water. Chinese water torture. We don't want that in our relationships. Amen, somebody? But some men are the same way. Some men are the same way. They haven't created a, a welcoming environment for their wives. And you know what happened? Their wives find somebody that will listen to them because the husbands don't. So we're going to talk about communication. And honey, let me say this very carefully. Communication. Look at the screen. Communication is is the delicate balance between what you're saying and what's the next side? What you're thinking. Have you ever found yourself saying what you're not thinking? Huh? Why do you do that? Come on, tell me, why do you do that? Why do we generally say what we're not thinking? I heard somebody, because you don't want to hurt somebody. But if you find a way to say it, that's not hurtful, they'll receive it. Let me give you an example. Here's an example. 
You could say to your wife, honey, every time I look at you, time stands still. Wouldn't you like that, ladies? As compared to sweetheart, you have a face that will stop a clock. <laughs> See, I said the same thing, right? You could say, you remind me of a cute little kitten. Or you could say, you remind me of a cat. I said the same thing, but in a way that was so palatable and so, so, right? Learn how to talk. If you don't know how to talk, get some of those books. How to Communicate Like a Man. You know, they said men are from Mars, women are from Venus. Well, men, some of you need to take a trip to Venus, and ladies, some of you need to go to Mars. Can I get an amen? Learn the language. We're going to talk about love languages. But this is where, this is why, and this is the one I told you. I'm going to reveal the biggest area why relationships fall apart. According to, according to Gary Chapman, which I consider one of the foremost uh, leading counselors in when it comes to marriage. This man is fascinating. He has many books he's written, many years he's put this together. He says in the couples he's worked with, 87% of couples that divorced said that they did not communicate. So some people talk long enough until the children leave home, and then they don't talk anymore. Some people talk to be cordial, but they never talk beyond the surface. They talk shallow stuff. How's the weather? So what do you think about Harry's new car? They talk about everybody's stuff that doesn't really matter except their own. My wife and I have learned the art of talking where it hurts. The uncomfortable things of life. And let me tell you why many people avoid that. You got to get this. The pain of being reborn again. The pain of strengthening your relationship is followed by the joy of a strong relationship. If you don't learn how to talk about the tough things in life, you'll never get past the tough things in life, and you'll only experience the tough things in life. So here are some possible approaches to of resolving communication. Say the first one with me. Let's go back to that. Say for the, together, what is it? Ask for what you want. As I said yesterday, you don't go to a restaurant and say, bring me whatever you want. You ask for what you want, right? Ask for what you want. And what I mean by that, I'm not talking about cars and, and clothing and another television and a couch, but sometimes say to your wife or your husband or to your spouse, all I want you to do is speak kindly to me. Just talk, just speak kindly to me. I had to say to a couple once, Talk to your husband like you would talk to a stranger. They say, what do you mean by that? How many strangers do you meet when you, how many strangers do you say to when you meet them, I don't really care what you like? Have you ever said that to a stranger? Why do we say that to the person that we dedicate our lives to? I don't care what you like. We talk to people, we talk to our spouses in ways we don't talk to strangers. So I said, until you learn how to speak to your husband or wife, talk to them like you would talk to a stranger. Ask for what you want. The other one is express your feelings. Have you ever, have you ever bottled up your feelings because you, you, you felt that your spouse or husband didn't really care how you felt? Don't have to answer me. But some people have done that. I know a husband that said to, him, to me once when I was counseling them, he said, when my wife cries, I don't really care about it because she's using her tears to manipulate me. Well, they broke up three months later because he, he thought her tears were manipulation when in fact the tears were evidence of her pain. But he didn't care about her tears. I'll teach you how to express your feelings. And then the other one is listen actively. Listen how? You know what, you know what active listening is? Active listening is this. Not listening just to hear what they're saying so you could jump in. Some people listen long enough. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Have you ever done that? And? You're waiting for, like, double dutch. You just can't wait to get in there. And when you get in there, you don't even hear, you never heard what they said. You just want to get your point in. Yeah, 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 you're, you're, you're right. You're right, you're right, you're right. But, 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 
But I'm not done yet. But, okay, when you're done, I'm waiting. You're right. Sure. Can I say something? I'm not done yet. Okay, when you're done, I'm ready. That's not active listening. We're going to talk about that. We're going to illustrate that together. It's going to be fun. We're going to show you. We're going to, we're going to let you behind the curtain of how we grew together and how we're still growing. Is that all right? Listen actively. Active listening, well, I'll tell you when I get there. The other one, make encouraging comments. Compliment each other. You know why? This is powerful. If you don't compliment your wife, somebody else might. If you don't compliment your husband, somebody else might. And what happens is relationships begin where they should not. Make encouraging comments, though. Sometimes I walk into the kitchen and my wife says to me, why are you looking at me like that? I said, honey, you look good. And she says, stop it, you're making me uncomfortable. I said, that's okay, I have license to do that. <laughs> right? Flirt. Marriage should not only be expressed in the physical act, but you could flirt with your mate. We, sometimes we're at dinner, and, or sometimes she might be talking to you, and I'll catch the corner of her gorgeous hazel eyes, and she'll look at me and she'll say, why are you looking at me? I said, <laughs> I said don't do that. I said, oh, you look so cute. Do that. Come on, ladies. Don't you like that? To your husband, well, nobody said anything. <laughs> Maybe. But, you know, put those things in a valuable place. Make encouraging comments. And the other, and the other one, seek to understand each other. We're going to talk about that today. And then the other one, let me go. Here, the, another one, say it with me. Talk about your problems. We're going to talk about that. When you're talking about your problems, don't make what kind of comments? Derogatory comments. I'm moving up so I could have my wife come up here. Don't make derogatory comments when you're talking about problems. The other one, don't be a what kind of listener? Judgmental listener. Everybody knows what that's like. While you're talking, you're saying to the, I know what you're thinking. You, you know, I, know what you, I know exactly what you're going to say because we have only been accustomed to judgmental thinkers. And then the other one, if you're not satisfied, what are the last two words? Say so. I'm not satisfied with that. I don't want that. And I'm not, I'm not talking about dinner. I'm talking about the way that your spouse, your wife, or your husband is communicating with you. Now, this is powerful. Come on up, honey. We're going to show you some things together. You know, come on up, sweetheart. And you know what, guys? Open the door for your wife every now and then. <laughs> Nobody said amen. That's terrible. <laughs> We, we try to model for younger guys and younger girls. So, uh, you know, it makes it harder nowadays because you have cars with clickers. And you walk up to it and it just opens up. But in the olden days when you had to open the door, a lot of guys opened the door for their wives. But even though we have a clicker, I still do that for my wife. I, I, not all the time. But I do it. And she says, oh, you opened the door for me today. Yeah, honey. And she said, well, I like that. I mean, I like that. Every now and then it reminds me that I'm still being, I'm still being an, a husband. I want you to see this. This is something we're going to talk about today. Okay. Yeah, empathetic. Empathetic compared to egocentric. These are two powerful terms. My wife and I are going to comment back and forth on this because what I love about us studying together, what I love about us studying together, and I told you about my sermons. I think I may have told this group. When I'm working on my sermons, my wife finds out the topic, and, she, and, and as I'm working on my sermons at my desk, she'll go get like Patriarchs and Prophets or Desire of Ages or whatever the book is, and she'll be reading stuff, and I say, ooh, 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 that's really good. Well, as I'm preparing for the marriage seminar, my wife is reading about all these great things because, you know, we do these seminars. And I said, honey, she said, what topic are you talking about tomorrow? Okay, great, great, got it. And gems, 
gems. So if you want to have a great relationship, work on projects together. But I want you to see this. Empathetic, empathetic listener. Viewing the conversation through our spouse's eyes. Let me ask you the question. Is that important for, you, for somebody to see things your way? Is it important? Because you know when they don't see it, when, when you know they don't see it your way, well, tell me, if I, don't, if, 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 if I don't see things your way, how do you feel? I feel awful because I, I want you to understand me, okay. what I'm thinking, or what I'm going through. My feelings matter too. That's right. Right? So oh. I want you to get, be empathetic with me. Okay. Or walk in my shoes. Okay. You hear that, ladies? And even though my feet are bigger than hers, that's not what she means. But it means try to understand what I'm saying. Try to try, and notice what I'm saying, try the attempt, try to understand, because you know what? The other part of that is egocentric, viewing the conversation through our own eyes. And, and Dr. Gary Chapman points out, and this is sad, this is true about sin. One doctor said, don't be biased. And then he said, everybody is biased. Well, when it comes to relationships, Everybody is egocentric. By nature. Say it again. By nature, we are that way. By nature, we are all egocentric. Meaning, it's say it. It's all about me. It's all about us. Me, me, me. So we don't often want to lay ourselves down because we want to find out what's best for us. It, don't we do everything that way? When we order dinner, do we order the dinner that we know our spouse is going to eat or we like? what we like. When you are empathetic, you have, and by the way, being empathetic or having empathy is not something that's natural. It's like, it's like a spiritual aspect of the relationship. Being egocentric is natural. It's like the carnal nature. It never wants to die. It wants to force itself. Remember in 1 Corinthians 13, remember how Paul says, love does not behave itself, is not puffed up. That's ego. Everything that it says is we are not to be is the egocentric parts. But love suffers long and is kind. That's the empathetic side. It's broken down into empathy and ego. So what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about empathy and uh, the egocentric side. And we're going to give some, uh, these are statements here that I want to show. And don't leave yet, honey, because we have some time. But we're, gonna, we're not going to go through all of them today. But these are statements that I've heard that I think we need to bury. And too many men have said this. How many have heard the phrase, happy wife, happy life? How many heard that before? Now, I'm not going to ask you if your wife has said that before, but I've heard Adventist couples say that. You know, and they go like this, happy wife, happy life. They kind of point to her behind her back. Happy wife, happy life. And then she comes up and she says, if Mama Bear is happy, everybody's happy. That's an egocentric person. In other words, our family will be just fine if Mama Bear is happy. Mama Bear is happy, everybody's happy. We should never live our lives thinking that the happiness of one person means the happiness of everybody. I don't ask for a lot of amens, but can we get an amen on that? Amen. It's, the mutual, it's the mutual empathy. Not, and, when, and here's the danger. When you become mutually egocentric, that means the both of you are at a place where she's not wrong and neither am I. And we fight and we battle and we want to win. But one thing, let me see if I have it in here. I think I do. Say it. You win together or you what? Lose together. You're on the same team. And here's why you have to remember that. In the very same way that Satan is ever trying to separate Christ, the people of Christ, from the Lord, Satan is ever trying to separate the husband from the wife or the wife from the husband. And when ego has a large part to play in that, it's easy to happen because... Some person says, she don't care about me, 
and she says, he don't care about me. And they're both ego egocentric. They both just want their way. They think that the relationship is Burger King. For those of you that are vegan, say it. Have it your way. And if I can't have it my way, I'm going to get my way. And they walk away, and they don't really care about it. Well, we have learned through the years, because when we were dating, <laughs> this is funny, we, would, <laughs> we were dating, and we went to, when we were dating once, we went to an arcade. I think we were like maybe 18 years old. This is a funny story, but this, we worked through this. That's why I'm telling the story. When we were dating, we were at an arcade together, and I won some prizes. And what did you say? Do you remember what you said? You said, you won all the prizes. And I said, but I won these prizes. But you said, I won all the prizes. <laughs> so here we are. <laughs> I won it. And you wanted it. I, I won them, but she won of them all. <laughs> how selfish I was. Yeah. But that's how we were. Yeah. And I got so angry. I said, here. And I had an umbrella. When, <laughs> when, when golf umbrellas first came out, I had a long golf umbrella. And here we are in the middle of, we're in Manhattan, we're by Radio City, we're by, you know, 6th Avenue, and they have all these tall buildings. And I got so upset, I took my umbrella and threw it as far as I could, and it landed in a deep water fountain. And it was not until it splashed in the water fountain that I wanted it back. But I had to practically drown to get it. And let me just tell you, I never got it. Here's my point. When you're egocentric, Arguments go farther than they need to go, and things happen that you wish never happened if you only made the selfless decision to lay yourself aside. Some of the keys to empathetic listening, and we're going to get to this. Listen with an attitude of what? Understanding. That means seek to understand, not just to find out what they're saying so that you can go ahead and dive right in when they're done. The other one, withhold judgment on your spouse's ideas. Don't say, that was dumb. <laughs> Even though you think it, but don't say it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I want you to say that again. No, good, no, that was good. No, what did she say? <laughs> Although you think it, what? Don't say it. Don't, don't say, say it. it. You got like, so, honey, you, you, you should paint your car pink. Well, that one I'll say no. <laughs> but I'm just, that's an extreme example. If you think it, don't say it. The other one is affirm even when you disagree. You know what that means? That means you're listening. That means what your wife or what your husband is saying, you at least give them the reason or the freedom to say it. And nothing is more debilitating then a wife saying something, and she could tell while she's saying it that he ain't having it. <laughs> you done yet? No. And she said it, but it hit a brick wall. It's like an egg thrown against a metal wall. It just slides down. So at least I let you say it. But she knew it didn't go anywhere. The other one, share your own ideas only when your spouse feels understood. Now, this is powerful. That means if your wife is coming up with an idea or your husband's coming up with an idea and you want to butt in, wait. Let them express fully about their thoughts and feelings. And don't feel the need to break in and alter it and edit it. My wife is an editor. <laughs> she, she's an audio editor. But since she's become an audio editor, you, can, I get, can I say it, honey? Since she, huh? It's between us in this audience, okay? <laughs> That's right. Just, uh, I'm not telling you. Since she's become an audio editor, she's become an editor of my audio. And I say, honey, can I just say it? Well, Okay, and so now I've made her aware of it, so she doesn't edit my audio. Amen, guys? Come on, man. Do you like your wife editing your audio? 
guys are smart. They're not saying anything. <laughs> I got to go back to my camper after this. I am not sleeping outside tonight, and I'm not going hungry for the next two days. <laughs> and here's... And, that, and thank you. Say it, honey. That doesn't happen in our house. No, We've we, never slept in a, no, in a couch or in another room. Never. Never That's in right. our married years. Praise the Lord. We have learned when things get tense sometimes to deal with it and find a way to readjust. It's like, I like that. We should put, ooh, thank you. We should put lame departure warning devices in our relationships. Oh, you guys are not that techie yet, huh? Well, if you get a new car, they have these devices. It was started by Mercedes about 10 years ago. Lane departure warning. So the car senses, if you're getting out of lane, it literally now straightens your car out. Now, for some, sometimes that's good, but sometimes if you're trying to avoid an accident, it's not the best thing. So you can enable it or disable it. The point of the matter is, in the relationship, we should have some devices that says, you're getting out of lane. Come on back in here, and we have learned how to do that. Amen? Don't depart. Don't try to run away from the argument. Don't try to escape from it. Deal with it. Get past the pain of discussion to the birth of unity. And you know what? We've learned how to cry together, laugh together, argue together. But later on, we say, honey, let's go out to dinner. Say that. Woo. You should have heard what she just said. Arguing was terrible. Making up is fun. Shh. The wise man Solomon and my wife gave me this text. A fool finds no pleasure in understanding, but delights in hearing his own opinion. You didn't know that was in the Bible. All he wants to do is tell you what's important for him or her. I don't want to understand. I don't even care. I just want to tell you what I would do. A fool finds no pleasure in understanding, but delights in hearing his own opinions. Wow, isn't that powerful? Now, let's go quickly. I'm going to go through this one. Okay, conflict resolution. We talked about both on the same team. Conflict resolution, having a problem, using tools. We're going to talk about that. I'm not going to go with that right now, but what I'm going to go through very carefully. Okay. okay. Okay, here we are. Okay. You ready? Come on, honey. This is, our first, this is our first example. Look at this. Now, let's stand here so they can see. Listen with your eyes. Let's say that together. Listen with your eyes. It means that what you are saying is important to me, undivided attention. Now, when I became a pastor and I started pastoring in California, the greatest complaint that I would hear people would say, you're not listening to me. Now, I'm from New York. We don't have to look at you to hear you. Case in point, Donald Trump. No amens. But I'm not a, that's not a political attack. That means he could listen to six people at the same time without looking at them. That's a New Yorker. Anybody from New York, help me out. Yes, one New Yorker. We could have nine conversations. How you doing? Hey, what's up, buddy? Hey, good to see you. I'll see you in a minute. That's a New Yorker. So I had to learn, well, my wife is talking, an example of listening with my eyes. Go ahead and talk to me, honey. And I'll show you an example of not listening with my eyes. Honey, you want to go out later? You want to go somewhere? We could do something real, real nice. Would you look at me? Okay. <laughs> I'm talking to you. Would you, can we do something? Can we go out? Huh? You want to do something later? You notice she knows I'm not even hearing her. Not a word. But watch this. Going it's going over my head. Let me see. Okay. It's go but, if I, but if she's talking to me, now that's, this is listening with my eyes. Start all over again. Do you want to go out later? Mm. We could go to that nice restaurant that just opened up. Wasn't that a nice place? That yeah. was a really good one. Yeah, we, yeah, we ate there once. You want to go back there? I love it. Okay, love well, it. let's really do it. Eye contact. Let's she do it on date night. Thursday's our date night. Thursday's our date <laughs> night. Is. We might not be here on Thursday night. Yes, just we will. <laughs> <laughs> Pastor Doug Bassett will be. But, anyway. but, um, but that's the point. Listen with your eyes. People like undivided attention. And you know what happens? The eyes become the doorway, the avenues to the soul. 
When you're looking in your wife's eyes or when you're looking in your spouse's eyes, you can immediately tell. Do you know how many expressions are, are do you know how many expressions exist in your eyes? The eyes in a, is an amazing place of expressions. It's deep. You look in your wife's eyes, you can tell whether she's in pain, whether she's about to cry, whether she's happy, or whether she's saying something through a deep place of darkness and hurt. But if you don't look at the eyes, you might hear, and when you're not paying full attention, it never makes a difference to her. She said, you didn't hear a word I said. And you might say, I heard everything you said, but because your eyes were not involved in the conversation. So what do we, what do we need to do to be empathetic? What do we need to do? Listen with our what? Eyes. Almost like an oxymoron, but it's not. One more before we transition to tomorrow. Here's the next one. Listen with your mouth. <laughs> Keep it closed for at least five minutes. Interjecting your ideas too soon indicates you are not in empathetic mode. I'm going to illustrate not being in empathetic mode. Start talking to me. Honey, do you remember you know that what? person you we just what? met? You know what? You know what? You're not listening to... Wait, um, you know... We went out the other day and that, that person we met... But the place that I'm met, talking about that we need to eat... It was so nice. It was such a nice but, place. But, but the place but, I'm talking about we need to eat... What, what are you talking about? What, Burger but, King, not Wendy's. No, no, no. I want to go to Wendy's. Well, you know, uh, you know what? I, I'm, I'm continually breaking, breaking in, in with my mouth. Yeah. You're not listening. But if I keep my mouth closed, go ahead and try it again. Wow, let's go out tomorrow night. It's going to be so nice. It's our date night. I can't wait to go. We're going to have so much fun. We're just going to enjoy each other. We're going to talk and laugh and hold hands the way you always do. And so I'm just... I mean, I now those are on the easy topics. Yeah. But if you, do it, if you get used to it on the easy topics, it's a pattern that carries over into the tough topics. Mm. Listen with your mouth. And what does that mean? Keep your mouth closed for at least five minutes. Now, what we're going to do tomorrow is we have 12 more. So tomorrow, what I'm going to do, my wife and I are going to be up here as coaches. Tomorrow, what we're going to do, and I hope you participate, we're going to invite some of you to come up and practice some of these things. Would you mind doing that? How many of you don't want to be up front? Raise your hands. Okay, good. You all hams, just like me. Okay, great. Tomorrow, we're going to have some of you come up and illustrate some of these things. We're gonna, we want to start practices in your life that will help you enhance your relationship. Are you okay with that? Okay. Now, when you leave here today, if you haven't come to the 11 o'clock seminar, do come by because we're talking about unclean spirits every day at 11 o'clock. And many of you have been here. If you haven't been here, it's a powerful topic for your family, your children, your grandchildren. If you want to know more about it, we have some DVDs with us here. But if you want to stop at the ABC, stop by and see that. And by the way, I haven't done singing while I've been here. I've been in a capacity that I'm not normally in. I'm normally singing, but I do have some music at the ABC I'd like to bless you with. Do stop by there. We'll be by there a little later on after the meetings tonight. But thank you so much for coming. Remember, listen with your eyes and listen with your mouth. Those are the two examples. Let's pray together. Loving Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you for the couples that have come, for the marriages represented here, even if one of the spouses are missing. Thank you that there is a desire to grow and to be strengthened in relationships. And Lord, regardless of our age and how long we've been married, we can always learn something new. We can be strengthened. Practice makes us better than before, but in this life there are no perfect relationships. We just want to be more like you in our marriages. Bless us and the time we've spent together today, and send us forth, Lord, with this reality. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. See you tomorrow morning, 11 o'clock, and then on 3.30 tomorrow afternoon.